Hey, seventh graders, it's me again, uh, back for another lesson. So last week we had talked about the uh, Roaring Twenties and that time period in uh, U.S. history when things were really exciting. There was a lot of change, a lot of positive change. There were um, more women in the workforce. There was a lot more money being circulated. People were dancing, exciting. I mean, it was really the Roaring Twenties. Now, um, this week we're going to transition to something that happened at the very end of the 1920s and then uh, what set the tone for really the decade to follow. We're going to be talking about the Great Depression and then what um, eventually helped the United States crawl out of that Great Depression, which really lasted for about a decade. So uh, to start talking about the Great Depression, what we're going to talk about first is something called the stock market crash. So the stock market crash um, happened in 1929. And basically, um, in the 1920s, there were so many people starting to invest in the stock market. And things were so good in the economy that people literally thought that it couldn't go down, that they could not lose money in the stock market, that it was a sure bet. A lot of people made a lot of money. And with that came this false sense of security. In fact, um, there were even people who were so eager to make money in the stock market that they started spending money that they didn't have. They started buying on margin. Basically, um, think of like using credit. You know, people use a credit card. They don't really have the money. They maybe pay like a little bit of it and then they pay it off over time kind of thing and hoping that they're going to make money. That's buying on margin and over speculation where people were spending money that they didn't really have with the hope that they were going to end up making a lot of money. Well, what ended up happening um, in 1929, the stocks started to dip a little bit and people basically started to panic and to freak out because they had all this money in the stock market and they had a lot of money that they could not afford to lose, money that they didn't have. And if they would have lost, they would literally lose everything, which a lot of people did. So when all of these people started um, panicking that the stocks were dipping a little bit, People were selling their stocks left and right. They're selling them for much lower than they had purchased them for. Um, basically, you know, a stock is going to be worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And people at this time got really, really afraid and they were not buying stocks. And so people were literally selling stocks for nothing. They were losing their fortunes, losing their life savings, and it spiraled out of control, basically. Um, when that happened, so it started on October 24th. That was called Black Thursday. And there were billions of dollars lost that day. And then it continued again into the next week um, on October 29th, and that's called Black Tuesday. On both of those days, there were billions and billions of dollars that were lost in the stock market. And, you know, people lost their entire life savings. They lost money that they couldn't afford to lose. They lost money that they really could never pay back. So, I mean, people were really in a bad, um, in a bad place after that had happened. And one of the big... Um, kind of effects of that were these bank failures. So at this time in the banks um, in the United States, there was not really an insurance system. So if people were putting their money in the banks, there wasn't really a guarantee that they would be able to get their money back. Um, most people obviously would, but um, what ended up happening after the stock market crash, people started going to the banks all at once. And the banks, you know, they don't um, keep all of your money in one place at one time, just ready for you to have it. A lot of times banks, they hold your money for you, but they invest some of it and that's how they make money as well. So when the stock market started to crash, the banks were losing money. And then all of the people who had their money in banks started, you know, um, going to the banks and taking out all of their money at one time. When you have all of these people going to the banks at one time, taking out all of their money, it caused a lot of banks to close. Uh, a lot of the banks went bankrupt. They were um, losing all of their money. They didn't have insurance. Uh, to give people back their money. And uh, at that time, thousands and thousands of banks closed. And that really um, caused another big, big hit to our US economy. So here's, I'll show you a couple pictures from the time. Uh, there were stores that started uh, popping up. This is the, the poor man's store. People were literally trying to sell anything and everything that they could because they were so broke. They had lost everything. And, you know, either the stock market or their whole savings had been lost when the banks went bankrupt and started closing. Here's a picture of... Um, 
a young woman and her children. Um, as you can see, they're wearing kind of what looks like burlap sacks. They're tattered, you know, they're barefoot. Uh, just, you know, people literally had nothing. They were just trying to get by with what they could, um, what they could muster up. You had children, you know, who were starting, um, you know, to beg and try to find ways that they could help their families more. Uh, you know, some kids even holding signs, why can't you give my dad a job? You know, trying to get work for their, uh, for their, for their parents. You know, a lot of people became unemployed at this time as well because with the economy taking a total nosedive, there was not, um, there was not a way for employers to keep all of their employees. So a lot of people lost their jobs. Millions of people became um, displaced, homeless, unemployed. It was really something that um, impacted millions of people in the country. And again, this happened over a span of about 10 years. It was not, um, it was not a quick fix. There were so many people that were uh, traveling from town to town looking for uh, work and just trying to find a way to provide for their families. Uh, some towns like uh, you see here, this was a sign outside of a town where it said, jobless men, keep going. We can't take care of our own. Okay, so basically telling people, hey, if you're walking through town, you're looking for a job, keep going. We don't have work here for you. This was such a common problem. This uh, political cartoon, uh, I think, is kind of interesting. So, you know, with the bank failures, there were a lot of people who weren't, you know, buying on uh, credit in the stock market and literally lost their money because they trusted um, the banks to, you know, keep their money safe. So uh, you see the squirrel here saying, why didn't you save some money for the future when times were good? And the guy says, well, I did. Okay? He's a victim of bank failure. So this, um, this Great Depression was impacting people from all um, different classes and all over the country and even people who were trying to do the right thing and save their money and have a savings for a future, you know, ended up losing their money when the banks closed. Some people holding up signs, people really uh, desperate, just trying to, um, you know, trying to find any way that they can to provide for their families. And some people, you know, went into a deep depression and times were incredibly desperate for people. You had, um, you know, people lining up around soup kitchens. Uh, this was uh, outside of um, a place in Chicago that had offered free coffee and donuts for unemployed. Um, this particular uh, business had been opened up by the notorious mobster Al Capone. Um, at this time, we had talked a little bit about uh, the mobsters and the mafia last week with prohibition and how organized crime really got, um, you know, a, a jump start back in the 1920s. Well, in the 1930s, a lot of those mobsters and uh, people in the mafia and organized crime, you know, they took some of the money that they had and they tried to give it back to the poor. So this was really kind of creating an era of you know, uh, the Robin Hood mentality. And um, so people had, um, you know, kind of new vision of what their heroes were. And some of the new heroes were people um, who were bank robbers. So uh, here's a picture of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde were two uh, notorious bank robbers. They were a couple that uh, robbed dozens of banks. Um, they had killed a number of people as well on their crime rampage. Uh, another man, oh, there's, uh, sorry, there's a picture of Bonnie right there. And then another bank robber of the time is John Dillinger. Don Dillinger, um, John Dillinger, he had robbed about uh, like 24 different banks. And, uh, you know, these people who were out robbing banks became um, kind of an icon for people. A lot of people really uh, had a lot of distrust in the banks now at this time. They felt that the banks robbed robbed them of their life savings and their money. So people were starting to rally around the people who were, you know, who were robbing the banks, that whole, like I said, Robin Hood mentality. They're stealing from the rich and, you know, giving to the poor. So, you know, obviously bank robbers are not, you know, people who you want to look up to, but during this time, there's so much distrust with the banks that, that, um, that bank robbers became incredibly popular during that time. So uh, the president of the United States during this time uh, is President Herbert Hoover. And uh, Herbert Hoover really got a lot of, um, he got a lot of 
bad attention um, during this time because people felt that he really wasn't doing enough. Um, he was a president who had believed that the government really didn't have um, didn't have a place in um, being involved in the economy of the United States. He was very hands off. He didn't want to overstep. He didn't want to start like federal relief programs because he really felt that the economy was something that was not the government's job to monitor. Um, and in fact, during this time when all of these uh, millions and millions of people are being displaced and they're uh, losing their jobs and people are homeless and they're living in, you know, basically these little uh, shanty towns and shacks and just trying to survive, a lot of these little uh, towns kind of sprung up around the outskirts of cities. And they were just little towns, I guess, um, that were just made up of a bunch of shacks where a lot of people who had lost their homes were living in. And these little shanty towns became known as Hoovervilles because people were so uh, upset with President Hoover and kind of blamed him for the depression and not helping um, not helping people uh, get out of the depression. Uh, the one thing that Hoover did sign was uh, that Haley Smoot tariff, and basically um, he signed that tariff, which essentially had a reverse effect. So what a tariff is, it's when um, we put a tax, or it's not when we, but just in general, when a tax is put on um, imported goods. So basically the idea of this tariff that was uh, designed by two congressmen, Holly and Smoot, they said, okay, hey, if we put a tax on imported goods and make imported goods more expensive for people, well, people are going to buy American goods more and that's going to bolster the economy, which, you know, makes sense in theory. But what ended up happening is when the United States put a tariff on imported goods from other countries, well, the other countries were like, well, okay, if you're going to put a tariff on our goods, well, we're going to put a tariff on your goods. And no more, um, no more did other countries buy goods from the United States. And so instead of, you know, helping bolster the economy and uh, have an increase in American goods, it actually had the reverse effect. And um, our international trade partners stopped buying goods from the United States. We're not buying goods from other countries. And it actually made all goods uh, prices rise. So not only were people already out of work, unemployed, homeless, they couldn't afford anything anyways, but now the prices for goods are rising. And uh, people basically blamed Hoover for that and that, um, you know, saying that that tariff had made the depression even worse. And um, when uh, when the presidential election of 1932 rolled around, um, it was basically a landslide for President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who won that election. So um, in comes Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, FDR is what he's often referred to as. And uh, so Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, he had been the Democratic governor of New York City, or sorry, of New York. And he had kind of a long history of trying new things and um, being somebody that wasn't afraid to you know, um, have the government involved in helping people. He says, um, you know, new, um, new days are coming. There's a bright horizon. He had kind of a campaign song, happy days are here again. And people really rallied around FDR and thought that he was the man for the job to get us out of the Great Depression. So here's a picture of FDR um, and his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, you know, if you look down um, at the base of his feet, you can see um, a brace at his foot. So when FDR was just 39 years old, he came down um, with some sort of a disease. They're not exactly sure what it is, uh, maybe polio, something like that. But because of his disease, he actually was paralyzed from the waist down after the age of 39. And, you know, it's amazing. Um, most Americans had no idea that he was paralyzed. Um, he you know, tried to hide it and he would wear leg braces so he could kind of wobble around, but he was in fact paralyzed. And um, he actually ended up dying in office um, during his fourth term when, um, you know, probably from some sort of a complication from his illness. But yeah, FTR, uh, he actually, he did serve four terms while he was president. So 
after FDR had passed away, that's when um, the U.S. government passed uh, the 22nd Amendment, which put a term limit on um, on presidential um, presidential bids. So before that, you know, there had kind of been the precedent set that, you know, a president would serve two terms. That was just kind of the tradition, the way it had been done, uh, stemming back from uh, George Washington. Uh, but it wasn't a law at that time. And then um, during FDR's presidencies, he had run uh, his first term, um, second term, and then he went for a third term. He won that. He ran for a fourth term. He won that. And unfortunately, he had died in office um, just at at the start of his fourth term. So when he started his first term, um, he, in his uh, inauguration speech, he says a famous quote that maybe you've heard. He says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And he really rallied around, you know, the people. And he um, started something that was called like the New Deal. Um, in his first 100 days, he started outlining his New Deal, his plan for getting the United States out of this depression and helping people. Um, he calls for reforms and changes to government. Um, he really makes the government a lot more, um, I guess, involved in what was going on with the economy and people's lives and starting new government agencies. And, you know, really, it, polar opposite of Herbert Hoover, who was kind of criticized for not doing anything. Uh, FDR did a lot. Uh, something that FDR also starts during this time are uh, something that became known as fireside chats. So uh, radio was kind of that immediate way back then for people to get their news right away. Um, a lot of people had radios in their homes if they could afford them. And he had started giving these weekly fireside chats where he would get on the radio, kind of like giving like um, a press conference nowadays, right? And he would, you know, um, have different topics that he would discuss. Um, he he had outlined early on that with his New Deal and helping us get out of the uh, Great Depression that we needed relief, recovery, and reform. So he would often talk about what he was doing and what the government was implementing to, you know, um, get the United States out of that depression and get us the relief, recovery, and reform that we needed to keep moving forward. And, you know, a lot of people really um, liked hearing him talk. He had a very kind of deep, calming voice, and it was really reassuring for people to hear the voice of their leader, of their president, um, you know, telling them what he's doing to getting, you know, to get us out of that depression. And for a lot of people, it brought the president right into their home. You know, people could, you know, tune in and listen to the president every week. And it was something that really made FDR a president of the people. Uh, when he started uh, his New Deal, if you look here at uh, the backs of the t-shirts of the kids rallying around him, there's different acronyms, uh, WPA, PWA, AAA. So he started a lot of different um, agencies that had these different acronyms to um, get us out of the Great Depression. So the first thing he wanted to start um, and focus on was how to get us relief. So relief was what can we do right now to get people the help they need? So this is, you know, getting people the money they need, the support they need, um, basically what the government could do in the immediate that would help people in their current situation. Uh, something that he had started were uh, bank holidays. So uh, bank holidays are days of the week um, that he that uh, banks would typically be open, that FTR has said, okay, banks are going to be closed on particular bank holidays. And it gave um, the government an opportunity to have the banks closed and to kind of do an assessment of what banks were doing well, which ones weren't doing well. And um, it made it so that people's like for that day that the bank holiday was happening while they're doing kind of their investigation, people's money was safe. So they didn't have to worry about, you know, the bank closing that day and losing all their money. So that was something that he had did. And then um, another thing he had did was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Um, that was an agency that um, helped people uh, by giving them um, money that they needed, help people with jobs, things like that. Um, really getting people back to work and getting them the money that they needed. 
So with the recovery, um, so recovery is basically what can we do that's going to help us get out of this depression? What can we do that's going to help us get better? And um, this, uh, this particular, um, I guess, part of his New Deal was um, making our country better. Um, he had started um, different organizations that created a lot of temporary jobs. Um, and he did a lot of things that would help the infrastructure of our country. So um, there was a couple there, the WPA, the TVA, and what a lot of um, those were working on were like creating um, different uh, waterways and dams and roadway systems and you know building the country up people working together um, a lot of these jobs were like I said temporary they weren't very long lasting but in the immediate they helped not only um, make our country stronger by you know having more infrastructure but then it got people back to work at least for the time being so making our country better and stronger and um, starting to get people out of work creating jobs and um, really trying to bolster up the US economy. And then reform is basically, okay, what are we going to do to make sure this never happens again? So to make sure that we never can, you know, have this massive Great Depression like this again, what can our government do to help that? So this is kind of a change in laws. Um, these things are permanent, things that are long lasting, and actually um, some of the things that had been implemented by FDR during that time are still around today. So the FDIC, um, that's a big one. That basically is the insurance agent, or the insurance that's put on banks to make sure that if a bank is going to go under, your money's protected. So, you know, nowadays we don't ever have to worry about if a bank closes, you know, losing all of our money um, because there's the FDIC. That's that insurance that helps that. Uh, the other thing that had been implemented is Social Security during that time, which is still very much um, something that people rely on today. Um, all of us when we're born, you know, we're issued a social security number or when you become a citizen, you're issued a social security number. And what that does is, um, you know, throughout your life, you're working, you're putting money into your social security account. And um, ultimately when you retire, or if there are people who are unable to work, there's this fund, this social security fund that, um, you know, gives people uh, payments um, monthly after they've retired or if people um, are not able to work. It, you know, make sure they have money to, um, to be um, provided a living. So that's another FDR era uh, program. So if you take a peek at this chart here, this shows the unemployment during the Great Depression. So obviously 1929, I mean, it just absolutely is rock bottom, it's plummeted. And uh, you can see that unemployment, um, unemployment goes up really, really high. So it starts off really, really low. Most people are working, everything's great. And then as the Great Depression hits, that unemployment rate goes really, really high. It skyrockets to almost like 25%. Um, and then as you see the years go on, that starts to go down. 1937, it's you know getting lower. And then you see it start to go up again. So, um, all good things, you know, um, that were happening. They didn't last forever. A lot of the jobs were temporary. So there were, um, you know, there were uh, more spikes in unemployment that had happened as well. So FDR um, had another challenge coming too. So another uh, reason why unemployment went back up, uh, something that had occurred during this time that became known as the Dust Bowl. So if you look at this picture here, this is a picture from that era. Um, basically, there was massive dust storms that spread across uh, the Midwest. So the Dust Bowl um, basically had been kind of a perfect storm of droughts and uh, farmers over farming their land and not over um not like uh changing out their crops from year to year it was incredibly dry and when it was so dry and uh the crops were just kind of drying up too because of the drought and over farming um basically there was these huge dust storms that came and they spread across the united states some of the dust storms were so bad like a dust storm that would start in kansas would go all the way and make it uh, to new york city i mean it was all over and these dust storms were absolutely massive and took a um, made a big hit to agriculture and farmers especially 
So this is the area, um, if you see where the dust storms were huge. So Oklahoma, Oklahoma and Kansas were hit the hardest and then those dust storms did spread across the US. So during this time, uh, you had a lot of people, farmers, especially from, you know, those really hard hit areas who started moving out west and migrating just to find a place where they could, you know, make a living because, you know, when you're living in the midst of a dust storm, you can't farm, you have nothing, um, you know, people started moving out west. So here's a couple other pictures. This is uh, April 14th, 1935, outside of Texas, you can see, I mean, if you just imagine like waking up and looking out the window and seeing a huge dust storm coming in. It's a family um, from that era, 1936. I think it's kind of cool to see the color. So uh, this photograph um, is probably one of the most famous from the time period, but this is a young uh, mother uh, during this time. She's got her children and she's just kind of looks very, um, you know, deep in thought and just kind of wondering how is she going to provide for her kids. So with this um, dust storm and kind of a second wave of unemployment and people needing a lot of help, uh, FDR implements the second New Deal. So there's more programs that he implements. Um, he's reelected again um, and really starts to try to bring our country again out of this, you know, um, out of this Great Depression that we we're still in. So he does get some criticism. Um, you know, he tried a lot of things. A lot of things worked. A lot of things didn't work. And that was kind of the, I think, kind of the cool thing about FDR is that, you know, if something wasn't working, he didn't just, you know, keep, keep trying it. I mean, if he, something wasn't working, he's like, okay, well, uh, with that, let's try something new. Uh, but he was criticized with, um, really bringing in more big government and making the government more involved in people's lives. And um, deficit spending was another big criticism. So deficit spending is basically when the government is spending money that we didn't really have. Um, in FDR's perspective, you know, we as a country were so in debt in such a great depression, millions and millions of people had nothing, you know, so from FDR's perspective, spending money and putting our government in debt was worth getting people out of debt in the immediate. So, but um, he did get a lot of criticism for that and just, um, you know, bringing more big government into people's lives and um, really uh, starting a lot of programs that were more like social, um, like social welfare type programs. So here's a political cartoon from the era, uh, the new trend in Easter fashions. So basically we've got um, FDR there, he's uh, painting the barn, it's time for a new coat. So, you know, if something's not working, we're just gonna, you know, throw a new coat on over it. We're gonna keep trying something new, keep putting, you know, a fresh coat of paint over the old paint and, you know, until we get something that works. So that was kind of the, per the perception of him. All right, so the legacy of the New Deal. So um, during that time, the government did start taking a bigger role in people's lives. Um, the government had more programs that people could use. They were um, more involved in kind of the federal government had more oversight uh, versus just the state governments. A lot of the programs implemented then are still in existence today and people still rely on them. Um, and you know, with that Great Depression that had happened and, you know, it wasn't something that was going to be fixed overnight. Uh, the Great Depression and the effects of it really lasted for over a decade. It wasn't until probably about 1941, um, until about the time of World War II, when the U.S. was kind of out of that Great Depression. So really, it had lasted that full decade of the 1930s until the U.S. had um, kind of, you know, um, bounced back from that. And then, you know, of course, after that, uh, World War II comes. So, you know, really, it was an era of... Um, devastation for a lot of people. It was an era where the government was trying new things. Um, you know, FDR became a very beloved president. Again, like I said, he had served four terms. He's the only president ever and since who has served that many terms. Um, and, you know, a lot of what he did didn't work. A lot of it did work and some of it is still around today. So hopefully you learned a little something about the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, the New Deal, um, all of that. So, so 
uh, stay tuned for more um, more to come about that. So if you guys have any questions about anything, um, please you know let me know. And I hope you guys have a great week. Take care.